Last dono of the day. Thank you for the content, smile XQCL. Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers lawful detainments, possession of stolen property, and officer conduct, and is brought to us by the News and Observers channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On January 14th, 2021, yeah, an unidentified that, Harnett County resident reported her dirt bike is stolen to the Fuquay Varina Police Department in North Carolina. 16 days later, the resident contacted a seller through Facebook Facebook, who she believed was in possession of her stolen bike. The resident and her boyfriend arranged to meet with the seller to verify that it was the bike that had been stolen from her, and were able to positively identify the bike through its vehicle identification number. The resident then contacted the Fuquay Varina police and informed them that she had located her bike and gave a brief description of the seller along with his name, Malcolm Ziegler. Two officers were then dispatched to Mr. Ziegler's home to investigate a possible case of felony possession of stolen property. Okay, what's your name? Malcolm? Yes. What's, Ma what's your last name? Malcolm Ziegler? Yeah. Okay. You got your ID on you? No, I do not. Okay. But that wasn't us riding. We haven't rode at all this week. Where, where do you where do you stay? You stay here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I haven't rode at all today. She could have just came by here. Hi. Who's that guy? Who's that guy running down the street? That's his friend. They, okay. They stay somewhere up there. Okay. Do me a favor, man. Go ahead and put your hands on your back for me, okay? Within minutes of arriving on the scene, the initial responding officer decided to place Mr. Ziegler into handcuffs without verifying any of the facts associated with the encounter. The question of whether or not Mr. Ziegler was legitimately detained is a major aspect of this encounter, and it is important to examine the court's perspective of what constitutes a lawful detainment. The Fourth Amendment was intended to protect citizens against arbitrary arrests and unreasonable searches, and the Supreme Court has routinely verified its intention through various rulings, and held that some objective justification must be shown in order to validate any seizure of a citizen. In the 2001 case of Atwater versus Lago Vista, the Supreme Court held that although the case involved, quote, gratuitous humiliations imposed by a police officer who was, at best, exercising extremely poor judgment, case-by-case -case analysis of the legitimacy of any given detainment should be relegated to statutory rule rather than constitutional scrutiny. The court reasoned that if every detention could be challenged on the merits of a Fourth Amendment violation, quote, lest every discretionary judgment in the field be converted into an occasion for constitutional review, and held that so long as probable cause was present, a detainment is justified, regardless of the severity of the crime. In the 1991 case of County of Riverside versus McLaughlin, the Supreme Court upheld the notion that individuals subject to detainment or arrest are entitled to a quote-unquote prompt judicial determination of probable cause, and upheld a Should previous ruling that limited the time allotted for a like prompt determination to 48 to hours from the, the time of the seizure. Working trial. in tandem, the Atwater no, and McLaughlin rulings essentially provided officers with nearly unbridled discretion to determine whether to make an arrest or issue a citation on well, any given disaster. charge, even if the charge is as minuscule as a traffic violation, and hold the suspect for up to 48 hours with little to no recourse. The court also reasoned that an officer's true intention was not a prevailing factor in determining the legality of a detainment or arrest in the 1996 case of Wren versus United States, and that the legitimacy of a detainment depends almost exclusively upon whether or not probable cause existed at the time of the detainment. Okay. In an effort to properly Wait, determine does it mean, does it mean when that the bike stolen is not probable cause? In a seizure occurs, I don't get it. the court held that the appropriate inquiry is, quote, whether a reasonable person person would feel free to decline the officer's requests or otherwise terminate the encounter in the 1991 case of Florida versus Bostick. According to the Bostick ruling, it is clear that Mr. Ziegler was not free to decline the officer's requests or terminate the encounter, and it is likely that a court would determine that he was officially detained once the officer placed him into handcuffs. However, the officer failed to validate any of the claims made by the complainant before deciding to detain and search Mr. Ziegler, and as mentioned earlier, probable cause is a necessary element okay, in determining enough. whether a detainment is valid. At the moment of Mr. Ziegler's detention, the officer had no way of objectively knowing whether he was in fact in possession of stolen property and was operating purely on the hearsay and speculation provided by the complaining party. Given that the officer lacked any objective substantiating evidence at the time of Mr. Ziegler's detainment, it is entirely possible that a court would rule the detainment unlawful. Can I get the- Wait, 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 but I thought the lady um, filed it as stolen in their database and saw it, said she saw it and then the bike looks visually there, right there, did you not see it? Well, I mean, I mean, proof. She, she, she filed that stolen. 
and as mentioned earlier, probable cause is a necessary element in determining whether a detainment is valid. At the moment of Mr. Ziegler's detention, the officer had no way of objectively knowing whether he was in fact in possession of stolen property, and was operating purely on the hearsay and speculation provided by the complaining party. Given that the officer lacked any objective substantiating evidence at the time of Mr. Ziegler's detainment, up? it is entirely possible that a court would rule the detainment unlawful. Can I get the bill of sale and show you that I bought it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get all that taken care of, man. But what I what I need to do is just hang tight for me right here, okay? Oh my gosh, what did I do? Just hang tight for me right here, okay? The officer well, leads not... Mr. Ziegler to his patrol vehicle and searches him. During the search, Mr. Ziegler informs the officer that he is a minor, and the officer decides to place Mr. Ziegler into his patrol vehicle while another officer makes contact with Mr. Ziegler's father in an attempt to locate the bill of sale. During the search, the officer broadcasts a code 1095 mm. to dispatch, which is widely accepted to mean that an officer has a subject in custody yeah, yeah. with the intention to perform a formal arrest. Well, I'm gonna work on getting you out of this soon, okay? Just keep walking with me, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll get everything squared away. I don't, okay. I'm, and, and sir, I'm trying to find this bill. So I sir, and, and, and I'm not saying that French you stole Canadian. it. Just right just now, don't. what we've got is we just got a stolen motor vehicle. Um, we're not saying that you stole the vehicle. Okay, I'm not saying that at all, okay? Yes, but it, it still is a crime to be in possession of a stolen motor vehicle. The officer informs Mr. Ziegler that they are not accusing him of committing the act of stealing the dirt bike, but that being in possession of stolen property is still a crime. Section 14-72 of North Carolina's general statutes covers the crimes of larceny, receiving stolen goods, and possessing stolen goods, and states that, quote, the receiving or possessing of stolen goods of the value of more than $1,000, while knowing or having reasonable grounds to believe that the goods are stolen, is a Class H felony. According to the language of Section 14-72, the offender must have had prior knowledge or a reasonable indication that the property in question was stolen in order to be found guilty of the violation. And in the 1953 Supreme Court of North Wait Carolina a minute, case the, of State versus Brady. So the, if the guy stole it, so he knows it's stolen, but they have no proof that he knows it is stolen because he's the one that stole it, he can't even be charged with possession of it, a potential property, because up to his best knowledge, it wasn't stolen. Court clarified that in order to be convicted under Section 14-72, it must be proven that, quote, A, the stealing of the goods by some other than the accused. B, that the accused, knowing them to be stolen, received or aided in concealing the goods. Let's and C, go, continued such come. possession or concealment with a dishonest purpose. However, that does not necessarily mean that an individual cannot be arrested without the officer first proving that they had such knowledge. The burden of proof rests upon the state, and it is often to difficult to prove whether or not a suspect talk. had knowledge knowledge of the item's history prior to obtaining possession of the item. As mentioned before, an officer's arrest must be based on objective facts that led them to believe that the individual may what have had this? such knowledge. What the fuck is without this evidence to prove that bites. the item was obtained through a legitimate transaction, a court would likely find such an arrest to be reasonable. In this interaction, Mr. Ziegler offers to show the officers a bill of sale to prove that the dirt bike was purchased through a legitimate transaction in good faith, which would dissolve the necessary clause of possessing the bike with criminal intent. So he, your dad, he's talking with your dad right now. Um, I can tell you, I can show you if you can go. On, I can, you can go on my phone. I can show you exactly what I bought. Okay. From. Okay. Hey, how are you doing, sir? Hey, um, Dad, I need that so, bill of sale. Reason all this is going down. Um, that vehicle's been entered as stolen. International Crime Information yeah. Center. Do you have the bill of sale, by any chance, sir? I, 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 don't, I don't know what it is. It's either in my room hey, or in the garage. You gotta tell me where it is, man. I saw y'all sign it, but what did you um, do? What is Look, the guy's name that sold you the box? I think it's like Tony or something. Like, if you go on my phone, you can look at the Facebook profile. Okay, well, I'll tell me where the bill is selling. Go look on the counter and see if it's on there. What counter? Inside the kitchen, the first one that has all where you put the mail at. Mr. Ziegler's father and one of the officers go back to the house and begin searching through various bills of sale to locate the one associated with the transaction involving this particular bike. While Mr. Ziegler's father is searching for the correct bill of sale, Wait two of the responding officers discuss the legitimacy of Mr. Ziegler's detainment. Hey, is he detained or 1095? From what I heard, 1095, and that was before I even verified the VIN. Okay, but that's why well, my first thing I asked. That's that's what I okay. now I'm not 100 percent certain, but I believe I heard 10 I heard essentially 1095 before I was even able to verify. Man, police, I'm on a budget. Get Upon this clarifying whether Mr. Ziegler shit, had man. been detained or arrested, one of the officers confronted the initial officer about his decision Jesus. to handcuff Mr. Ziegler. Hey, is he detained or is he? He's detained right now because he is 
he did he's not. 14. He's 14. Yes. Okay. So I already explained to him he's detained right now. I told him that. So why is he detained? Because that's a stolen motor vehicle. Okay. I mean, I mean, okay, okay. Let's look. Let's okay. Okay. Wait, Jack. Tell me if I'm making an argument that's good or bad here. If he's saying he's in the position of a, then under that pretext, then they should have detained the whole, everybody that came out of the house or everybody in the house, right? Because he's just as valid as anybody else in the house, right? Right? Technically, they want to go with this dog shit uh, narrative, then they should have detained everybody in the house. So, I mean, Diggs verified the VIN number, right? Did you... Is that before all that, that you verified before you... I, I detained him and okay, then we verified that's why I asked if he was 1095 or detained. He's detained. Okay. So, obviously he's a juvenile, right? Yeah. You're not charging him with larceny of a... Nope. Okay, because obviously that didn't happen. Yep. Here. So, worst you have is what? Possession of a stolen motor vehicle. Which is, you going to think you get secure custody and all that? Probably not. Or a petition. All right. The 14, me personally... He ain't going nowhere. You're here with what, Dad? Mm -hmm. Ain't no sense having him sit in the car tent with handcuffs on. Where okay. you ain't. If he was 18, and you might be taken to jail for possession mm -hmm. of stolen property. Right. Different. Come, but come, we ain't, come, you ain't going to take him to jail, come, right? It's going to be a petition. Come, come, come. The confronting officer urges the other officer to consider the practical implications of his decision to detain Mr. Ziegler and points to the distinction between the protocol for adults and minors. There are vast discrepancies between how What's the here? law and legal process applies to adults and minors. And arresting a minor it's generally a invokes a much more thorough and determinative process than arresting an adult. According to a guide assembled by Youth Justice North Carolina, which is an organization of law and policy experts focused on the juvenile justice systems in North Carolina, the juvenile the juvenile court process begins when a complaint XQCL. alleging that a child is a quote-unquote juvenile delinquent is filed with the juvenile court. A juvenile delinquent is any child ages 6 to 15 who is alleged to have committed a crime or infraction. And individuals who are 16 or older go directly to the adult court system, not the juvenile system. Juveniles may be taken into temporary custody only under one or more of the following conditions. One, a law enforcement officer witnesses the juvenile commit or has probable cause to believe that a juvenile committed a serious crime. Two, a law enforcement officer or court counselor has reasonable grounds to believe the juvenile is beyond the disciplinary control of his or her guardian. Or three, the juvenile escaped from a residential facility. The person who takes the juvenile into Sorry. temporary custody must notify the juvenile's parent, and a juvenile cannot be held for more than 12 hours, or 24 hours if it is a weekend or a legal holiday or by a judge's order. Petitions for juvenile delinquency are processed by a court counselor and typically involve an intake meeting whereby the determination is made to either dismiss the complaint altogether, divert the case to restitution, community service, mediation, or a counseling program, or to file a petition which orders the juvenile and their guardian to go to court. If the parent is served with a notice and does not appear in court, the judge may issue a quote-unquote show cause order which can result in the parent being fined or jailed. In this instance, the confronting officer questions whether a full-scale detainment is necessary, given the fact that the initial officer only intended to submit a petition for juvenile delinquency, and further asserts the notion that the initial officer did not have any objective basis for detaining Mr. Ziegler when he was placed into handcuffs. The initial officer agrees to release Mr. Ziegler, but also questions whether or not he would be justified in charging Mr. Ziegler with possessing stolen property anyway, and the confronting officer once again urges the officer to consider the facts of the encounter before making such a decision. I'll go ahead and take him out. Um, question for you. Um, so, supposedly, I know they're working on getting the bill of sale right now. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked him plenty of questions, but he's been running his mouth. He said that he got it from some guy off in Lewington, okay? okay. My whole thing is, I know legally he can still be charged. Yeah. Um, if he's got a bill of sale, me personally, Yeah. I have grown up racing dirt bikes, buying four-wheelers. I got yep. three four-wheelers at the house now. Yeah. I've never once had one run until I was a cop. Yep. If, if basically, what you're saying is if he has a bill of sale, you wouldn't end up filing the petition. No, but I'd have him in the top of county and try yeah, to yeah, figure yeah, out he got a problem or not. Hey, where all do you think that bill of sale would be at? So you can step out. We're going to take the handcuffs off. Yeah.
The officer removes the handcuffs, and Mr. Ziegler is allowed to enter his home where he was able to locate the bill of sale for the dirt bike. The officer explained to Mr. Ziegler and his father that as victims of a crime, they are entitled to restitution for the loss of their fund through the purchasing of an item that they were not aware was stolen. And after the owners of the dirt bike retrieved their property, the officers left the scene without filing any charges against Mr. Ziegler. Over a month later, the Fuquay Verena Police Department released the full body camera footage from all of the officers involved in the encounter, and Mr. Ziegler's parents held a press Excuse conference regarding the incident on March 1st. In the press conference, Mr. Ziegler's parents called for police reform and training, and suggested that race played a major role in this encounter, and went on to assert that their son had been arrested, not detained. In a response to the controversy, huh? Fuqua Verena Mayor John Byrne called for the community to move forward from this encounter and declared that the officer's actions were standard procedure and not motivated by race in any way. At the time of writing this episode, it is unclear whether the Ziegler family will be pursuing legal action. Overall, the initial responding officer gets an F. For detaining Mr. Ziegler before obtaining any no. substantiating evidence, exercising poor discretion by signaling an arrest to his fellow officers rather than a detainment, and for failing to consider the practical implications of his discretionary decision-making and authority. Okay, One of the most thanks. troubling aspects of this officer's conduct is the fact that even after he was confronted and corrected by the other officer and had evidence to prove Mr. Ziegler's innocence at his disposal, he still considered filing a petition against Mr. Ziegler and questioned the other officer's logic. One aspect of this encounter that was not yet discussed in this episode is that the initial officer was still in training, which is a testament to the notion that officers are often trained to focus on the criminal aspects of any given circumstance, even when innocent explanations are readily available and bear equal merit to the possibility of a crime being committed. If it had been left solely to the discretion of this officer, there is a good chance that Mr. Ziegler would have been inappropriately charged with possession of stolen property, regardless of whether he could prove that he legitimately purchase the dirt bike or not. And this interaction highlights the importance of consulting a superior before making decisions that could dramatically impact the life of an innocent juvenile. Okay, if the officer had simply afforded Mr. Ziegler the same degree of trust and opportunity to present evidence as he did the complaining party, then the fallout from this encounter could have been avoided. Yeah, I, ho I thought this whole point of training is that it's supervised so that you can't make it to It's like whenever you drive a car in the, in the, in the training driving, and a guy has the brakes. If you're about to die from a red light because you're dumb, they break. Waited entirely. The confronting officer gets an A plus for considering the real world implications of his fellow officer's actions, challenging the officer on the merits of his conduct, and ensuring that Mr. Ziegler did well, not face know. any unnecessary or unwarranted charges. Far too often are officers complicit in the misconduct of their co-workers, and it is certainly refreshing to see an officer object to the conduct of one of their own. Not every encounter requires an arrest, and officers sometimes tend to lose sight of the ramifications of subjecting an individual to the legal process in favor of securing an arrest or quickly restoring peace. It is imperative that officers consider the potential benefits or detriments to the community that their actions will cause, and take into account the effect their conduct will render to the individual beyond their arrest. I commend this officer for having the courage and conviction to challenge the initial officer's conduct, and ensure that justice was administered to the actual perpetrators of crime rather than punishing an innocent victim for being scammed. This officer's conduct is a great example of how community policing should be practically implemented. I enjoyed that. That was pretty good. I'm eating a smoke meat sandwich. Okay, look.